recording. This meeting is being recorded. All right, so let's get started with the first text. So this is Immanuel Kant. So just a quick review what he's doing in this book, right? It's important to, um, to, to summarize that briefly, right? So remember Kant is not, a, this is not a book telling us what is right and what is wrong. Kant is not interested in giving us a guide. He's not interested in teaching us anything, any content. Kant is simply interested in helping us awaken to the inner voice that is already there, which already knows what is right and wrong. Okay, so make sure you write this down that Kant is not going to tell us what is right and wrong. He's not going to tell us, you know, what is the good, what is not the good. But he's simply trying through this book to, to make us more aware of the inner voice that we all have already and which already is speaking. Um, this is wrong. This is good. So we all know in inside of us, we already know what is the right thing to do in any possible situation. And I'm sure you've experienced this. You're, you're about to make a choice, you're, you're, and you're hearing two voices. Usually we're gonna talk about these two voices today, but inevitably you have that voice gonna be like, well, maybe this isn't a good idea. And then the other voice overrides, you know? So, so we all have both voices and, um, which Kant calls the voice of instinct and the voice of reason. Okay, so let me write this in the chat just so that we have that vocabulary there. Um, okay, voice, wait, where am I? Uh, voice of instinct and voice of reason. So we have those two voices uh, and we'll talk about them today, but for sure we have the voice of reason. All of us have this ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And the goal of this book is to help us become more finely attuned to that voice. We all have it, but some of us, that voice has become so soft and the voice of instinct has become so um, uh, loud that we have forgotten even what the voice of reason sounds like. So today, so in this text that we're going to study today, we're going to learn to become again sensitive to what that voice sounds like. What is it saying? So that we can become more attuned to it when we are faced with different situations. Now, first hour of class, we're going to talk about the voice of instinct. So we're basically going to talk about what the voice of reason does not sound like. <laughs> this is the voice of instinct, which is one of the most dominant voices. Um, and, and we're going to look uh, into what the voice of instinct sounds like. We're going to find out that the voice of instinct is not bad. It's simply the voice that is interested in your survival. <laughs> it's the voice that is interested in your happiness. That voice will always tell you what to do to secure your own survival and your own happiness. And so that's the main voice we're going to study. And Kant is going to argue for the fact that we don't have that we have also deeper concerns beyond just mere survival. So we're going to talk about that. So, so today we're going to, so make sure you write this down. Today we're going to find out, or right now, first hour, <laughs> we're going to find out what the voice of reason does not sound like. We're going to explore the voice of instinct. And then in the second hour, we're going to explore more specifically the voice of reason, what it does sound like. Okay, so what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to, uh, summarize a, a section of the text first, and you can jot down the main ideas, and then we'll look at the quote and go over the same <laughs> ideas in the quote, right, in the text. Okay, so first thing what Kant has to do, and this is very important in his philosophical context. Remember, he's talking to people like Hobbes, who, according to Hobbes, we are not at all moral people. We are pure wolves, only interested in self-interest. Anything that we're gonna do is ultimately about securing our own happiness, even helping people. I'll help you because I know eventually you'll help me. Or I'll be moral to you because I know eventually that will keep me safe. I will keep the rules, I will keep the laws of the land because I know eventually that will um, create or foster my own happiness. So, so Hobbes does, and, and most of his contemporaries, did not believe that we have anything inherently moral. According to Hobbes, we are pure animal, <laughs> only interested in survival. There is not, no such thing as an innate sense of morality. And so Kant now has to argue for this. He has to actually show that we do have such a voice. And so he's, he's going to highlight, outline his argument on page, um, first few pages, mostly on page 20. So I'm going to go over his argument and then we'll read the text. So first thing he's going to say, he's going to say this. If we were indeed just animals, right? 
And if we were indeed just made for happiness, which is what Hobbes says, right? He's going to say, well, if we were made for that, then nature would not have done a good job in making us, right? Why? Because he says we have been given this second voice, which consistently goes against our happiness. Now, this second voice, animals don't have, right? If you have your dog and you feed the dog, I don't know, um, some chicken that has, you know, suffered do dogs eat chicken yeah so <laughs> chicken that, that has gone through all kinds of you know terrible life right not eating you know eating all kinds of junk and not being able to fly and being stuck in a cage all, all its life right the dog is not going to worry about that the dog is not going to have as it is eating the chicken of another voice saying you're eating a chicken that was not sustainably farmed you're eating a chicken that suffered you're eating right the dog is just going to eat now us when we eat that chicken and we have been told and maybe watched a few YouTube videos about how uh, the chicken has suffered all its life before it went on the plate, we're going to eat with mixed feelings. Well, hopefully. <laughs> Most of us, we don't even care. Right? But we're going to have a little bit of a, a ruined experience because we have this awareness that the chicken suffered and it's very sad. And here I am eating the chicken that suffered all its life. So in a way, says Khan, the fact that we were made with that other voice which consistently goes against our happiness, like that voice right now as you're eating the chicken, right? Telling you you should be a vegan because the environment is dying and the climate change and blah, blah, blah. So you're not really enjoying your burger anymore. He said, the fact that we have that other voice shows us that we were made for more than happiness. That's the essence of the argument. Okay, let me say it again, right? So he begins, he, make sure you jot this down. So first thing he says, so remember, he's trying to argue that we have another, that we have a moral sense, that we have something in us which is thinking about more than just survival. He has to argue for this against Hobbes. So he's going to say this, well, if we were really made for just happiness, then we were not made very well because there's consistently this other voice going to pipe up as we're enjoying our, you know, uh, whatever we're doing, which is not, you know, ideal, that voice is consistently going to go and make you feel miserable about your happiness in the name of something else, right? And so he says, the fact that we have these two voices that other animals don't have, they're just gobbling down the food. They don't care if it was sustainably sourced, if it caused climate change, they don't care, right? But we have this kind of other voice. And the fact that we have this other voice, says Kant, means that we were made for more than happiness. There's something else that we should be thinking about. Okay, as if we're, is everybody clear? Um, just wave at me if you're following me. Waving. Okay. All right. So let's let's look in the text. Um, yeah. So I'm on page. Uh, where am I? <laughs> no, I'm not the funny. I'm on page um, eight. I'm on page eight. I'm going to read one, two, third paragraph in the Natural Constitution. Who is with me? Just wave at me. Uh, Pokhran, you have a question? Yeah, so I was just wondering when Kant says, like, when Kant, Kant categorizes beings and things, so I was just wondering, so does, like, do children come into consideration? Like, do children are considered to have reasons, or, or are they considered, like, to not, not be able to, like, have any rational... <laughs> So I think, yeah, I think he would he would agree that even very young, uh, that's a good question because very, very, very young, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe he doesn't talk about children, but I would assume that the child, um, maybe not early, early when it's still merged with the mother, but when the child becomes independent, at that moment, he's autonomous, according to Kant, the, and at that moment, he becomes a rational being, right? Rational has to do with being autonomous. If you're still merged with the mother, you're not yet a rational being. Has uh, interesting repercussions for the debate on abortion. <laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> right. So for Kant, to be a rational being, to be considered a human being, a full-fledged human being, you need autonomy, which is the, the prerequisite of deciding I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Before you can decide anything, you need autonomy. So the child probably would have to have reached a certain amount of autonomy, which comes around two or something, as soon as they start to, you know, separate. Then they actually have a heightened aware. They know. <laughs> you can tell that they know, right? So, so uh, but that's interesting because if we were to take this idea further, Pokhrel, you're giving me ideas, is that if, if, a, if you have to be autonomous to be a, a full-fledged human being, then is a fetus, 
considered a full-fledged human being, right? And we, we wonder if Kant, right? Kant's position would be interesting here, I think, when it comes to, to the debate on abortion, which was not your question. Uh, Pokrell, do you have a, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. I saw another hand who, um, I can't see all of you. I, I can only see like three of you right now. <laughs> Let me go to the gallery. Um, um, uh, any other hands? No? Okay. All right, let me go back to speaker review. Let me not complicate things before I freeze. Okay. So let's go to the text. Um, everyone with me? Third paragraph in the natural constitution of an organized being. Wave at me if you're there. Okay, good. All right. So I'm reading. In the natural constitution of an organized being, one suitably adapted to the purpose of life. So he's saying, in the way we were made, right? Let us take as a principle that in such a being, no organ is to be found for any end unless it be the most fit and the best adapted for that end. So he's saying, we were made in a way that every single part of our body has a purpose. Okay, there's nothing that doesn't have a purpose. Okay, so he continues. Now, if that being's preservation, welfare, or in a word, its happiness, were the real end of nature, in the case of a being having reason and will, then nature would have hit upon a very poor arrangement in having the reason of the creature carry out this purpose. So, if we, if, so he's saying here, if we were made just for happiness, then nature would have done a really bad job in creating us with reason. Because systematically, our reason will go against our urge for happiness. The voice of reason is systematically going to go against the voice of instinct. And so if we were just made for happiness, then nature would have done a terrible job in creating us with reason. Okay, so I'll give you an example. So uh, let's take this example. So suppose you're uh, in a bar with some friends. And um, all of a sudden comes into the bar your crush. You've had a crush on this person for a few months and they have been dating, but now your friends are nudging you and they're like, hey, did you know they just broke up with their significant other the, the other night? Why don't you go up, you know, and make a move? It's your opportunity. Okay, so now here's my question. Let's let's go. We're going to, to um, uh, I'm going to scout out the class and see who is working along the lines of reason, who is working along the lines of instincts. I'm going to put gallery view. So uh, who... Who would go up? I'm curious. Who would go up uh, to the person um, and, and, and make a move? Okay, Multani would go up. Who else? Um, I'm trying to see more of you on the page. Who else would go up? Uh, okay, who would not go up? Who would not go up and just stay with your friends? Not move. Okay, Soto wouldn't go up. Davidov, is that a you not going up? Uh, okay, George wouldn't go up, so Castellanos wouldn't go Okay, let's start with Multani. Multani was, well, you guys are just flashing. This computer is going to destroy my mental health. <laughs> you have no idea the experience I'm having over here. <laughs> like, you guys are just moving and, and flickering. Okay, all right, Multani, start us out. Why would you go up? I'm curious. <clears throat> uh, so, my personality, I'm just... I don't know. I'm just an opportunity. Like if I see opportunity, I will take it. I don't care what the consequences <laughs> is. I would just take it. And also, if what if I don't know if there's tomorrow, I just want to get everything today. Okay, so very I, good. I, I, All I right, is Mul up to her and just do Excellent. it. Very good. All right, is Multani thinking along the lines of reason or along the lines of instinct? What do you think is dominating the decision here? Um, how many of you think it's uh, reason? <clears throat> Put your wave at wave at me on the screen. Okay. How many of you think it's instinct? Wave at me. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kogan, why do you think he's thinking along the lines of instinct? <laughs> um, because he's searching for instant gratification. I want this now. I like her. She's here. Don't worry about the consequences. Don't think about tomorrow. Instant happiness. I'm going to walk over to her now. Okay, good. Now let's be clear. Instinct is not always about instant gratification. He, what, what would what could Multani have thought through? Uh, let let uh, let me ask you this. What if the person chooses not? Well, actually, let me ask. We'll we'll find it ourselves. Uh, okay, so Multani, okay, strong instinct voice. Probably Multani, you will be happier than most of us. Right? You have a strong voice of instinct, meaning that you you are vested in your happiness, and you will end up quite happy as a person. Right? Very nice, healthy instinct. Now let's look at the <laughs> the other four people who will be miserable uh, <laughs> compared to Multani, uh, who have looked for misery. 
I think there was Georges, Davidov, Soto, uh, in that order. Let's start with Georges, then have Davidov, then Soto. Tell us why you wouldn't go up. Let's start with Georges. Um, I think in this modern day society, it's safe to say that when people are fresh out of relationships, they usually have some baggage or some healing that they need to do at first. So I'd prefer my significant other to come healed versus me having to um, have to uh risk take the risk of you know maybe possibly them still being in a place where you know they're not ready for to jump into another relationship or something with someone else you know just give them time to yeah give them time to accept themselves okay excellent all right let's see instinct or reason how many of you think it is instinct that is guiding josh here in his deliberations wave at me in the screen okay how many of you think it's reason wave at me in the screen Okay, actually, Georges is still thinking along the lines of instinct, right? Because he's thinking, he's calculating, right? So he's thinking, if I go to her now, she's not ready. It's not going to work out. This is not going to be good. Let me wait until she's ready and she has healed. And then our relationship has a higher chance of succeeding. So you see how instinct, still thinking about his happiness, right? Still thinking about along the lines of how it's going to work. Is it going to be a good relationship? Let me calculate this. Let me make sure I'm smart about this, right? So, so it's, but it's not instant gratification. He's willing to wait. So instinct, make sure you jot this down, right? Instinct doesn't mean necessarily instant gratification. It can be very calculating and think in terms of the long term, right? It can be thinking long term, but it's thinking long term about happiness. Are you following me? Everybody see now how this, how Josh is along the lines of instinct, wave at me. Um, if you're with me. Okay, now let's see if we have a different reasoning. Davido, why, why was your reason not going up? I mean, I, I'm tempted to change what I was originally going to say after your critique of George, but I have to make it, keep it consistent, I'll say what I was going to say, which is, yeah, basically, I think there's less of a chance of it working out if you go to a person that's fresh out of a relationship. I mean, I don't, I don't think I would mind dealing with baggage if this is a person that i like and uh, yeah, i feel like that's part of a relationship you handle the person at their worst and at their best but uh, i feel like uh, i would have less of a chance like especially if they're like literally happened last night they're probably really upset and so it's probably not going to be a good productive conversation that's going to happen if i approach them in that moment and so it's better to at least to wait a, a little while for things to settle down all right, same thing, right? Multani, you're in good company, right? A lot of strong instincts here, smart instincts, right? I still haven't heard. Uh, let's see what Soto has to say. Soto, why wouldn't you go up? <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint, but it's not really, you know, much different from what my peers have said. <laughs> and um, truthfully, you know, I was just thinking about me personally. I'm an overthinker. You know, for me, life is like a game of chess. I'm always, you know, I'm always trying to be a couple steps ahead. So I wouldn't go up because, you know, I would think of all the possible scenarios, you know, of not doing it this moment, just because, you know, if you go up in the instinct and so much can go wrong, it's not planned out, it's, you know, it's unprepared. So, you know, just waiting for that right moment, I guess. All right, lots of instinct here. What would, uh, okay, Kogan, you wanna, do you have another alternative where it might be reason? I'm curious, right? Who would, let's try to find a reason of not going up or going up. It could also entail going up for rational reasons. I'm curious we, if we can explore the rational. So Kogan, can you help us out with that? I'm not sure if this is considered rational or reason, but just um, that it's not fair to her, like be nice to her. She just went through a breakup, assuming it's a girl, like be nice to her. She just went through a breakup, give her some time, you know, don't be the guy who hits on her like a second after she broke up. <laughs> okay, so now you're okay. So now notice I'm going to be uh, super, super annoying right now. You're thinking of the happiness of the girl, right? Uh, and so you're saying, be careful, you know, you need to be, you know, be delicate with her because that would make her unhappy. Or maybe you're thinking of something deeper. I'm curious, are you thinking about her happiness? Uh, is this what you're thinking about? Or are you thinking about something else, Kogan? I mean, I don't know what else I would be thinking. I think it's just unfair. Maybe it's mean. Like, yeah. Okay, you're, you're, you're right. So let me see what Pokral has to say. Pokral, can you help us? Yeah, I was, I was just wondering. So would 
going to her and not hit on hit on her, but rather have like normal conversation about like things. Would that would that count as a reason? Like not for your benefit or like her benefit, but like not not actually trying to make her happy by consulting her because you you want to be like uh, presented as nice, but just having normal conversation as a friend, you know, as friends. So okay. would that. You're on the right track. So notice, right? You can stay or you can go up. It doesn't matter the action, right? What matters here is the intention. So here, uh, Kogan is saying, I'm not going up because it's not fair to her. So you're thinking now different along different lines than happiness. You're thinking about fairness, right? And then Pokrell, he's going up, right? But he's going up if, without the intention to hit on anybody, right? He's going up with a different uh, goal than ha happiness. So uh, there's also a different agenda there too, right? Uh, I have frozen. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> uh, am I frozen for you? I am. <laughs> no, no, no. No? Okay. Oh, so you're saying yes. Okay. Yes, you can hear me. Okay, good. All right. Well, I'll continue like last time in the void <laughs> since I can't see you guys anymore. So at this point, right, y'all just uh, pipe in, right? Because I don't see your hands or nothing. Uh, Georges, help us. I see your hand miraculously. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I was going to say perhaps a reason would be um, I know you often hear people who are on their deathbed say that they wish that they lived in the present more. And they wish that they took a lot of more chance. So it could be for some reason, you know, someone might think I might never see this person again. Uh, you know, it might not be uh, you don't care about the consequences, but it could be that, uh, you, I don't know, maybe you'll take the chance that this could end up being something good. Uh, okay. So, and there, are you thinking along the lines of happiness or... Or are you thinking about along different lines, right? You 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 live only once. I'm gonna miss an opportunity. That one still sounds like instinct, right? It's, so it's, it's not um it's not a necessarily along the lines of um happiness. It's more so um if say I'm someone who lives a life of I'm always in the present, but I I but say I'm also all at the same time aware still of the possibilities of things that can occur. Um, so versus if I say maybe you want, maybe it could be instinct as well. I guess it would be instinct if somebody wants to live a life of no regret. So then that's why they make their decisions. Yes. Exactly. Sure. Right. You're thinking, I want to live the richest life possible. I want to make sure I experience all of life. This is still an instinctual decision. Right. So you can notice. So I hope you can jot this down. Right. Instinct is much more sophisticated than we give it give it to be right instinct can be very calculating very it can think ahead uh, but usually instinct is focused either on my happiness or the ha even the happiness of the other person right falls under instinct and so we are now curious certainly because none of us really gave the argument that the voice of reason would give right that shows us how our voice of reason is still very stunted we have to develop it so but but we see here that instinct is quite broad and most of our decisions will fall under instinct. Should I eat this now? Should I eat this later? Should I marry this person or that person? Should I choose this career or that career? This is all the realm of instinct. What is the best thing for me, for them? That's instinct. So reason, we'll see, is going to actually sound altogether different. It's going to be a completely different direction than this idea of what's the best thing for me and what's the best thing for them this is still instinct so even if you're sacrificing right even if you're thinking of them of what's good for them you are still according to kant in the realm of instinct and so we have to wait we're gonna have to wait until we get to the second section right of the text when we study the voice of reason to really really decipher what it sounds like because right now none of us came up with it none of us was able to find it Okay, before we go to that section on the voice of reason, I want to do a little excursus on love. Kant has a tiny section on love here, which we'll do in, in about 10 minutes, and then we'll take a break. Um, and this is uh, on page, um, page 12, okay? And go with me to page 12, the last paragraph. Uh, Multani, you have a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> But you didn't really tell if we should go up to her or not. <laughs> so you can go up to her or not go up to her. It doesn't matter what you do for Kant. It's why you do it. 
right? So for so up until now, all the reasons you guys gave were instinct. You went up because you were looking for happiness or you were thinking of protecting their happiness, right? So 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 that that's an interesting question with Danny because for Kant, a moral action is not really what you're doing, it's how why you're doing it. What is your intention? That's what makes the action moral. And any action could be moral. Going up could be moral. Not going up could be moral, right? But we have what matters to Kant is the intention, why you're doing it. Does that make sense, Multani? Yes, thank you. Okay, and we're going to find out at the end of the second hour, we will know a different reason, right? A different approach. We were, we're going to hear the voice on, of reason on this particular uh, example. Okay, for now, quick uh, uh, parenthesis, uh, page 12, last paragraph, two definitions of love. So let me read it here. Um, undoubtedly, I won't ask you to wave because I can't see you, but I'm just going to start reading. <laughs> undoubtedly, in this way also are we to be, uh, or sorry, are to be understood those passages of scripture which command us to love our neighbor and even our enemy. So now he's going to comment on love, right? Based on, he's starting with a quote from scripture, but he's going to move into philosophy. Love as an inclination, Kant says, cannot be commanded. So love as a feeling, you can't command love as a feeling. Right, so he's saying, then why does scripture command us if you can't command love as a feeling? It must mean that love is more than a feeling. That's where he's going, right? So he says, love as inclination cannot be commanded, but beneficence from duty, when no inclination impels us, and even when a natural and unconquerable aversion opposes such beneficence is practical and not pathological love. So here he's saying, love nevertheless can be commanded, um, but it's not going to be in terms of feeling. And he says such a love, right, that comes even when you don't want to do it, even when you want to run away from the person and yet you choose to love them. He calls this practical love versus pathological love. So let me write these two terms in the chat. Um, so you have both distinctions. So we have two kinds of love. We have pathological and practical. So let me explain what each one means. So we have some mastery of that short passage. Pathological comes from the Greek pathos, which means passive. Okay, so it, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that that love is sick or pathological, right? It simply means that love is passive. That's what it means by pathological. Practical comes from the Greek praxis, which means um, act active. Okay, so when he talks about practical love, he simply means active love. Okay, so then he continues and he says, the love, which is a love based on feeling, that one is a passive or pathological love. But the love which is based on duty, you love because it's the right thing to do, that love he calls practical or active. Okay, so let me give you an example. Suppose you're in a marriage for 20 years and all of a sudden, right? Because you didn't follow Aristophanes' advice. Your soulmate comes into the office one morning, right? So clearly you married the wrong person. Here comes your soulmate. And now, of course, you're going to be tempted. Of course, you fall in love with the soulmate very quickly, and you're going to be tempted to leave your wife or husband of 20 years. So here's the question. What would pathological love prescribe and what would practical love look like, right? What would pathological love look like and what would practical love look like as you are struggling to make this decision? Uh, Kogan, go ahead. <clears throat> um, pathological love would say, I have to go where my heart is. And practical love says, I'm in a committed relationship. I've committed to this person. I have an obligation, a duty to this person, and I'm going to stay in my marriage and not mess around. Okay, very good, right? So pathological love is dictated by instinct. Pathological love is following the feelings. You're, you're just going to follow your whatever feelings you have. So you're passive in a way, right? And then, of course, if you choose to stay in the marriage, says Kant, that you, you will be then practicing practical love, which is the decision, right? Active decision to stay in the marriage. You're not following your feelings. You're being active and making a decision. Okay, so now you see the distinction. Now, here's that trick question. A uh, very interesting question that we can ask at this point. Which love do you think is freer? And we'll see something very profound about Kant in the way we respond to this question. Which love do you think is freer? So you can raise your virtual hand because I think I can see it. Or you can just pipe in because I don't see any hands right now. <laughs> so 
again my question and put it in the chat, which love is free or practical or pathological? If you're looking for freedom, which is the love you should be practicing? <clears throat> really, no hands, nobody wants to try? Ah, Georges, go ahead. <laughs> um, pathological. Why do you say that? Um, it seems like if it's something that you're choosing, oh, where my heart feels, or, you know, if it's something where you're choosing as long as you're happy, something like that, then you choose it within the given moment versus I feel like if it's practical and it's something that you're committed to and you're devoted to, no matter what the situation is at the given time, uh, it's a little bit more uh, harder to, um, it's a little bit more harder to um, stay on it versus so it's you're, you're you're not as free to get up and leave every time i think i remember somebody saying a quote to uh, uh it's about relationships it was like uh if you guys can get up and leave at any point then there's no reason for you guys to tell each other the truth okay good so but here's my question to you before i get the other two hands that i see but here's my question to you if um how do i put it oh i lost the question it was such a good question <laughs> Oh my God. Um, you were saying that pathological is freer because you're kind of following your heart, right? So here's my question to you. Are you making any, or is there any choice involved in pathological love, do you feel, uh, Georges? Uh, to in a sense, or you could be a slave to the heart. You know, it could be seen in a different, in two different ways. It could be seen now as you're a, heading, Now yeah, you're heading so. in some direction. You're, you're, you're on track. Okay, Davidov and then Pokrell. Which one is freer? Yeah, I think I think Terry kind of said it best in, in the end, where he said that for me, I think practical love is freer because it's the one that you actually have control over as a free agent that can make decisions. I mean, it's something that you can work towards with the pathological love. You're a slave to your heart sensations or like whatever the environment is around you. If your body deteriorates or if your lover's body deteriorates or if like society pushes you in a certain direction, like that's it, the feeling is gone. And the relationship is over and that's incredibly scary and so with practical love it's something that i can actually work towards and achieve i feel like we both have some joint control over it oh, okay excellent. To answer your question terry that's a jordan peterson quote <laughs> okay great good there you're 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 right there with kant right but let me hear pokrell before i i uh, tie it all together pokrell what did, what was your take yeah i was just gonna say this, something along the same lines uh, like, uh, from what I'm seeing, Kant would say, like, staying with your, like, current family, then going to your love would be more into the, into, like, his idea of moral, morality and, and duty as well, because you are choosing to, like, you, you're choosing your duty and you are, like, sacrificing your, I don't know, like, willingness to go out go with somebody else so if it was Kant I think he would say like he would say uh, is, is the active one means like since we are staying with the family right yep yep so yeah mm -hmm. I think yeah active would be more like I don't know if it would be freer but it definitely would be considered moral in terms of okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. So you guys answered all very, very well, right? For Kant, it's practical love would be the freer one. And I think even Georges started to see that towards the end. Why? Because pathological love, you're not choosing. You are swept away by these feelings, right? You're swept away by these feelings. You have not chosen this feeling. You are not choosing this obsession. And you have no say right in a way you're swept away you're not in control you are kind of dragged into uh this situation and so for Kant that love is not free because you're not autonomous you're not choosing and you're not in control however practical love even though it's it's more painful uh, pa practical love for sure it's harder to do but you're autonomous you're choosing and you're making the decision. So in that sense, you are in full mastery of the situation and of yourself. And as a master of your own heart, you are freer than the person who is not a master of their own heart, right? So that's interesting, right? We still don't know yet what is reason saying, right? But we're getting a sense uh, for sure that for, for Kant, if you choose the voice of reason, you are choosing to be free. 
And that's a very interesting point, right? So make sure you write this down, right? That for Kant, the practical love is freer because you are in full mastery and full control of your heart. You are not uh, uh, um, swept away by foreign forces. You are the agent. You are choosing. It is your decision. And for Kant, just to add to that, make sure you write this down, the voice of morality, which we're going to explore in a bit, the voice of morality, the voice of reason is always going to be the voice which sets you free. It's not free. Instinct, in a way, is not free. You are depending on something else to be happy in instinct, right? You're trying to, you want to have the girlfriend or you want to make a decision so that you have this or that or this or that. Instinct is usually not autonomous. It's, it's instinct is going after things in the world in order to be happy. But morality, it is entirely autonomous. It doesn't depend on anything outside of yourself. You are fully uh, free and autonomous at that moment in, in the making of that decision. You're not depending on the outside. So in that sense. Okay. Now, before we go into the second part, I want to give us a last example, which will help us, uh, which will lead into the, the discussion on the voice of reason. Ah, it's so annoying. I can't see you. I'm just suffering here with this computer um, whole, whole summer uh, with you. Okay. So here's an example. <clears throat> you let's imagine this. You have. Um, actually, I'm trying to think. Should we just stick with the? Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm not gonna bring a new example. I'm gonna stick with the example that we had where we went up to the girl in the bar. That's a good one because we still haven't heard the voice of reason on that, and we will in a bit. Okay. So how about we take a little bit of a break? It's 4 p.m. Let's come back at exactly 4.05 and we'll get into the second part of the text uh, and talk about the voice of reason. Okay, I will see you guys in four minutes. <laughs>
Okay, let's all come back for the last part of Kant. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Um, okay, can you guys, am I normal? Can you see me normally? <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> can you guys see me, hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right, I blindly continue <laughs> in front of a frozen screen. <laughs> okay, let's remind ourselves the example that we're going to look at as soon as we're done talking about the voice of um, reason. This is the going up, right? You're, the girl is just broke up. Your, your friends are nudging you. We've heard several reasons for going, for not going. All of them could be regrouped under instinct, except maybe a little bit Kogan talking about unfair, but it wasn't clear, though, what she meant by that. So now we're going to find out, right? We're going to find out exactly what would have been a rational uh, move here. And it doesn't mean going up or not going up is not the issue. It's why you go up, why you don't go up, right? Okay, but first let's go into this new uh, thing, which is the voice of reason. I'm on page 34. So, okay. Um, so quick, just a little quick introduction on the top of page 34. There is an interesting uh, quote here. He says this, here philosophy is seen in fact to be put in a precarious position, which should be firm, even though there is neither in heaven nor on earth anything upon which it depends or is based. So now we're going back to his position that if we want to know what is right or wrong, we can turn neither to heaven nor to earth. So let's analyze briefly what he means by heaven, what he means by earth. Can anybody tell me what he means here by heaven, that we cannot look to the heavens in order to know what is right and wrong, what is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Uh, so just raise your virtual hand or pipe up. Oh, Kogan, go ahead. Would that be um, like God, Bible? Exactly, right? So remember, Kant is a, he's a rationalist. He's coming from the 18th century. We, I, I mentioned in the intro, introductory lecture, that the 18th century is moving away from the religious, uh, from the medieval times, which are based on the authority of scripture. So he's saying here, basically here, he's referring to religion. We cannot uh, rely here on religion. We cannot rely on the scriptures, we cannot rely on the priests, we can only um, rely on, um, well, we'll see. <laughs> but for sure, right, he's uh, dismissing, I'm sorry, I'm fiddling with my camera, I don't know what you guys are seeing or not. <laughs> In fact, it's still the old, really, really, this is purgatory, this class is purgatory for me. <laughs> this technology is putting me through hell, okay. I don't know what you're seeing. Can you see me? <laughs> My camera stopped working, the, the good one. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so neither heaven. Now, what does he mean by earth? Who can tell me what he means by earth? What is that? What is this other source? Kogan again, go ahead. Would earth be like law, what the state mandates? Yes, you can say that, right? There were two ways you can understand earth. You can understand earth as the laws of nature, which a lot of philosophers were saying, you know, what is moral is what is natural. By the way, some of the debates around gay marriage, for example, is based on this argument that it's not natural, we don't see it in nature, therefore it's immoral. Uh, by the way, these people don't know penguins, right? <laughs> we know that penguins have same-sex couples. Uh, and I'm not even kidding. Uh, check it out, right? So, so, so nature does have a precedent, right? But a lot of philosophers said we need to follow nature when it comes to morality. This is a problematic. I'll give you an example why. I'll, I'll tell you a story where I found out that it was problematic to base your morality on nature. So I was like, hmm, I must have been like 12 or 13 years old. And I came home from a particularly dreary day at school. Uh, I didn't like school when I was growing up. And I was like feeling so toxic and disgusting from everything that had happened. And I'm like, oh, let me just go home and watch the Nature Channel. Do you guys still have the Nature Channel? Do we still have some equivalent nowadays on TV? No one watches TV anymore. <laughs> Nature Channel, hopefully. Anyway, so I turn on Nature Channel and I'm watching, you know, this kind of North Pole animals. They're called seals, which you certainly have heard of, right? They're very cute. 
And I'm watching and I'm watching this little baby seal jumping in the water. And then there's this daddy seal right there. And they're so cute. And then all of a sudden the daddy seal comes closer to the baby seal. I'm like, oh, and then I see the daddy seal get on top of it. And I'm like, what's happening? What's happening? And then the, the, in, the interpretation, right? The documentary is saying, oh, you know, when there's not enough females, then the males go on their little babies. And I was like, ah, <laughs> this is, I thought I was going to purify myself in front of this show. Now I'm even worse. <laughs> I'm even more toxic. Okay, so nature, clearly not a guide, right? You have incest in nature. You have all kinds of things in nature. So we cannot look to nature. The other thing that Kogan mentioned was uh, the state. And I think Kant would agree with, with you, Kogan, right? The state makes laws doesn't mean if it's legal that it's moral, right? We have a debate nowadays about uh, immigration. And around the border, we have a whole uh, debate happening whether can we, you know, whoever crosses the border illegally, it's illegal to help them. And yet people consider, right, that there is a higher uh, duty than to follow the law and they go and leave water for these um, migrants and so forth in the desert and so forth. So, so Kant would agree. Legal doesn't necessarily mean moral. And sometimes we are required to break the law for the sake of morality. The whole civil rights movement, right? The whole uh, uh, notion of civil disobedience for the sake of, of, of morality is something that Kant would stand with. Kant would have been part of the civil disobedience movement because he believes we have a higher authority than scripture or than the law. There is a higher authority within us, which we ought to follow and obey uh, at the detriment of any other voice. That is the most important voice, it's the inner voice. So ultimately we can't find in scripture, we can't find in law or in nature. Why? Because that voice is found within us. The voice of reason is something that we all have within us, right? Okay, any questions so far before I continue and now we go into the voice of reason. Any questions, any interruptions that need to be made? Clarification? Okay. All right, um, hopefully you can still hear me. <laughs> okay, so let's go on page uh, 35. Uh, we're gonna look at one, two, the, the second paragraph right in the middle, you have on the left, the word hence with a capital H. I'm gonna give you a little moment to find it. So this is the second paragraph, page 35, right in the middle of that paragraph, you have a sentence that begins with hence. On the left side, you can see a, a capital H, okay. So we're going to say some few similar things that we know already, but he's going to go deeper. So he says this, hence there arises the distinction between subjective ends, which rest on incentives, and objective ends, which depend on motives valid for every rational being. Okay, so now he's distinguishing between two things. He's distinguishing between, so I'm going to type it all in the chat, this is important terminology, subjective ends, which are based on incentives and then he's looking at objective ends which uh, take into consideration where is it um yeah which take into consideration the notion of rational being okay all of this is uh chinese until we're, we're gonna we're gonna translate it in a bit um but for now i'm just writing it down okay all right, incentives, sorry, with a V. Okay, so first, so let me translate. What does he mean by subjective end? Um, actually, anybody know? Can anyone tell me? Well, let me, let me just say. <laughs> subjective end based on incentive means this. You are making a decision based on the subject, based on you. What's in it for you, right? Incentive here means um, uh, what's in it for you, the subject right subjective okay so that's the first thing we see right when you're when you're when you're making a decision based on subjective ends based on incentives basically you're making a decision with uh, in mind well what's in it for me what's in it for the subject my goal is subjective right ends here means goals right make sure that's important right ends means goals or, or objectives right so you're here thinking about what goal this goal is it good for me that's subjective end, okay? Now, objective end is different. Objective end, you're not thinking so much about what's in it for you, 
you're thinking, uh, you're not even thinking about what's in it for them. You're thinking about the notion of rational being. So you're making a decision based on whether this, there is going to be, whether this decision will be valid for a rational being or not. So we have to understand what he means by rational being before we can go any further with subjective or objective end. Um, well, by, by now, by the way, you've guessed, right? That instinct is what is behind subjective ends, right? Let me write it all here. Subjective ends, incentives, and of course the goal here is happiness, right? This all belongs together. And then you have reason, which is behind objective ends, based on rational beings. And of course, morality is, is what is going on there. Okay, so this, this is, these are the two distinctions that you should be uh, holding in mind, right? So instinct is going to be the subjective ends. Reason is going to be choosing objective ends, which we're about to analyze. Okay, so we have to first understand what is a rational being. So if you hop to the last paragraph on page 35, you have a very clear definition. It says here, now I say that man, and in general, every rational being, and here's the definition, exists as an end in himself and not merely as a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will. Okay, can anyone translate to me what does it mean to be a rational being? Let's see if you can understand, have you understood this passage about the rational being is an end and not a means. What does that mean? Rational being is an end and not a means. Can anyone venture a definition? What does it mean to see somebody as an end and not as a means, right? I, I can try. Go ahead. Right. So to see someone as an end and not as a mean is to go against kind of the consequentialist approach to justice or other things that Kant has talked about, whereas a person has value in and of themselves as opposed to uh, a person a person doesn't only have values a value in terms of what they can achieve for the society. A person is valuable in and of themselves. So he would disagree, for example, with, uh, say, uh, you you punish a person, you put a person in jail because uh, locking them up makes uh, keeps the rest of society safe. For him, it would be, no, you put a person in jail because you're respecting his dignity as a free agent and you're punishing him for a crime that he's... Uh, committed and thereby respecting that he was free when he made that decision. Okay, good, right? So to see someone as an end and not a means means simply this, you realize that uh, a human being is is different from any other object in the room. Why? is different because they have value in themselves and not just for what they can do for you. To be a means is to be of use, right? So basically he's saying when you start to Treat so so there's there's uh, when you're looking at someone as a rational being that's what he's saying when you see someone as a rational being when you really um, want to protect their character of being a rational being you are abstaining from using them right so the the way that in a way we can uh, treat each other as human beings is simply by recognizing that that person has value apart from what they can do for me. They're not just there for me. That's what it means uh, to be an end and not just a means. A human being has value apart from being useful to me. <laughs> okay. So now an objective end and then is this. You make a decision with the goal of protecting the human being as a rational being. So morality is this. Is, is I'm, gonna make, I'm, I'm struggling between two decisions. There's one which pleases me, which makes me happy. And there's another one where I am protecting, where I am choosing not my happiness, but I am choosing to protect that human being as an end and not as a means. So going further, we're going to see, uh, go further what that means. This, he says, is the definition of respect. So let's go here on page 36, top of page 36. Rational beings are called persons. Inasmuch as their nature already marks them out as ends in themselves, we saw that, as something which is not to be used merely as a means, and hence there, this is the key, make sure you, un you underline this, there is imposed a limit 
on all arbitrary use of such beings, which are thus objects of respect. So when, when, when the voice of reason is piping up, usually it's going to pull you back. The voice of reason, let me say that once and for all so you can write it down. The voice of reason is always going to pull you back when it sees that you're about to use a human being. When it sees that you're about to infringe or transgress on another human being's dignity, right? And that you're going to disrespect them. So for so let me say that again, right? So the voice of instinct is always going to say, is this good for me? <laughs> right? The voice of reason is going to say, is, am I, is this decision protecting the dignity of that person or am I degrading them to the level of an object that I can just use and discard when I'm done? That's the voice of reason. The voice of reason will always uh, flash a red light when you're about to use someone or when you're about to discard someone. In other words, when you're about to treat someone like a vulgar object, the voice of reason will begin to make you feel uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Um, uh, just, uh, I don't know how you can tell me. Uh, just put yes in the chat if you're, <laughs> if you're with me. I cannot see you. Um, <clears throat> okay, I see a few yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. All right, thanks. Okay, so let me say it again so you can write it down, right? Voice of reason is always going to rein you in, is always going to pull you back when it sees that you're about to infringe on someone's dignity, when it sees that you're about to use them or that you're about to discard them like an object. That's what the voice of reason will do. It's, it's, it's all, and this sometimes will go against your happiness. There are many moments where we want to consume that person, <laughs> right? Or we want to have, we want to have them around us for something they can get us. And we are tempted to just take them, right? Or take the benefits from them. And at that moment, right? That's instinct. At that moment, reason will say, ah, maybe you shouldn't, right? Maybe you should respect this person and leave them over here, <laughs> right? Maybe. So anytime, basically, anytime you're tempted to use someone or to discard someone, this is when you should be feeling slightly uncomfortable. And at that moment, that discomfort, that is the voice of reason, right? The voice of reason is always going to come um, as a limit on your happiness, in other words, your happiness stops where the dignity of other people begins. Okay, let me write this down here. Um, that's the main idea here. Your hap or our happiness, right? Me too. <laughs> our happiness stops where the dignity of another human being begins. So the voice of reason is always going to be that stop sign. Like, okay. This was, you know, you were, you can enjoy, you know, the bottle, you can enjoy your pets, you can enjoy this book, you can enjoy even the class, but you cannot enjoy a person like that, right? A person is more than just an object of pleasure. A person also has value in themselves. So anytime you're tempted to use or discard, reason will make you feel, you will hear, you will feel a slight discomfort. And that slight discomfort is reason telling you, here you are not treating that person with respect. Here you are trespassing on their dignity, right? And that's where you, reason will rein you, it will pull you back. Okay, so now we have an idea. So let's, let's take a few examples so we can really get an idea of what this is. So let's go back to the dating example. What would have been now, maybe now it's clearer, what would have been a reason for going up or not that reason would have given us, right? We know what instinct would tell us to do, but what might reason have told us to do? Let's see if we can apply what we know about reason now to the situation of the a bar with the crush. Who wants to try to have a rational, uh, what would reason say at that moment, as your friends are nudging you, what would be the scenario? Davidov, go ahead. I guess Kant would say, you know, you shouldn't approach the girl at the bar because you need to respect her as a rational being and a free agent. You need to respect her dignity as a person who's just kind of uh, broken a bond with another person and you not violate, I guess, the sanctity of relationships by trying to impede on one so quickly after it's broken and you need to step away and also maybe validate your own dignity by not uh, jumping at what your instincts want you to do 
and by having a bit more control and not just taking advantage of an opportunity when you see one. Okay, good. And be careful. It's not Kant saying that. It's the voice of reason, <laughs> right? Remember, Kant is not telling us anything. He's just saying, this is what you are saying, right? This is what you should be hearing from within yourself. Uh, this is what you are hearing. So yes, so let me elaborate on what you said, right? Voice of reason would say, okay, this person right now, first of all, my main motivation for going up is to cons is to take, right, is to take this person, <laughs> right? I have a consumeristic approach. I want to grab this person, whether now or later, I'm thinking about grabbing them at some point. Reason would say, People can't be grabbed, right? You're on the wrong track already by thinking you can grab this person. And then reason might say, right, this person is still, is not fully autonomous. They cannot make a rational decision yet because they're still bound to the other person, right? So you will come up, but that person is not ready, uh, maybe, right? Because they are not yet a, autonomous, they're not yet able to make uh, a clear decision uh, because they're so muddled, right, by what just happened. They might follow you because they want to spite the other person, or they might follow you because they're vulnerable. Uh, you are now, they're very vulnerable. They're not very rational right now. <laughs> that would be one way to see it, right? They're, and so you would want to protect that. You would want to make sure you're not using that person or being used by them right? The, the temptation at that moment, the vulnerability is so great at that moment that either you will use them or they will use you, <laughs> right? So because the, it's a danger zone, uh, Davidov, your, your take would be to step back, right? And make sure that whatever, that because it's such a vulnerable situation where you might end up using them because they're so vulnerable, or they might end up using you, <laughs> right? Because they want to spite their ex, um, you want to maybe take a cautious step back. Um, so that would be the, the idea here, right? So, um, so, so, so excellent. Now, remember this, right? The, this notion of respect is not just about other people. It's also about ourselves, right? We are, we are meant, the voice of reason is also going to stand up when other people try to use you <laughs> and discard you, right? You will also feel the discomfort like, oh my God, that person just used me. Or that person just, you know, threw me out, ghosted me, they kind of cut me off, right? So anything like this, like cutting off people or ghosting people or, or using or consuming them, this is all, says Kant, you are now losing, right? The voice of reason would get very uh, uncomfortable with the situation because that person now has been degraded to the level of an, of an object that you can just use and discard and they have lost their personhood they have lost their dignity and that is the key here for that okay um anybody want to give any examples uh when it comes to romantic relationships um just curious if we want to go and give some practical examples of ways that we sometimes um use people as means and not as ends. I'm curious, anybody have any interesting story where you can highlight or, or uh, give an example of what Kant means here by dignity and respect? Any ideas? Otherwise I will just read about it in your essays. <laughs> okay. Um, Great. All right. So we are pretty uh, clear. Let me give, uh, maybe we will do the last example that I wanted to do earlier since we have a little bit of time. Um, okay. So here's the situation. This will be our last application of Kant. Suppose you are at the end of the semester, the final exam is coming up and it's worth 70% of the grade and you're studying for it. you you know that this is important and all of a sudden comes bursting in your room uh, weeping, your very best childhood friend, and they tell you, listen, my a family member just died. I'm, I'm completely out of it. I can't focus. They're generally a good student, but right now I can't study. Can you please let me cheat off of you tomorrow <laughs> on the test? Right? Okay, so I'm curious. How many of you would let them cheat? Put your virtual hand up. How many of you would let them cheat on the test the next day? knowing that if they can't pass that test, they will flunk the whole class and it's going to be catastrophic for them. So, okay, nobody? Okay, how many of you would not let them cheat on the test? Let me see your virtual hand. Okay, a few people. Oh, y'all are 
really hard hearted. Okay, let's start with the non cheaters. And then, is there anybody? Uh, so I see Castellanos, I see Khalik. Who else do I see? Um, for the non cheating, George Kogan. Okay, I got yeah, I got you all. Is there no one who would let them cheat? What, what is this cold hearted classroom? <laughs> Nobody cares about this. Part. Okay, let me hear some of you. Uh, let's start with Kogan, Khalik, then Georges, and then the last person who I forget who it is. Go ahead, uh, Kogan. Um, I feel like I feel bad for them, but I don't think, I think the instinct reason to not let them cheat is fear that if I get caught, I'm going to be punished too. Okay, so you're thinking along the lines of instinct, right? And, okay. and also that's a lack of respect for myself. Okay, there's reason a little bit too. Very good. Okay, you, you're getting it. Georges, how would you uh, diagnose the situation? <laughs> um, I would say along the lines of the same thing. Uh, instinctively, there's a chance that uh, I'm at risk as well of um, being um, caught if I uh, let them cheat. But And reason, you know, I obviously, it's uh, kind of... Uh, Depends, you know, maybe uh, maybe somebody, maybe they might get a higher grade for an assignment, or maybe it might be seen as, you know, I did the copying, or, you know, so obviously respect is my, for myself as well, but also um, respect for the other person, because I'd want them to put themselves in a situation where they actually understand what they're doing. You know, maybe you took a course where, uh, you know, this wasn't uh, at your level, you know, maybe you need to uh, retake the course and understand it in, in greater uh, in greater knowledge. Uh, if we had doctors who cheated, then I don't think we'd be in a <laughs> situation right now. So, you know, we want people who actually, who qualify, who are capable of doing these things to actually be in these fields. So, yeah. Okay. Interesting thing you said, we want doctors who don't cheat. Is that an instinct or reason uh, a, a direction, uh, Georges, do you uh, think? I think it could be both. You know, if I got cancer, I don't want to die. The, okay, that's the instinct, right? No, notice yeah. how instinct is not necessarily instinct is pretty smart. It's like, yeah, if we have doctors who cheat, then you know that's heaven forbid, right? So that yeah, that's, but also, also for them though, they wouldn't become someone, you know, yeah, uh, like they wouldn't be able to reach that point in that you know in their field or become successful if they don't uh, know what they're doing. Okay, very good. So you have a mixture, right? You have some good good instinctual reasons and then also a little bit of rational. Very good. Um, I hope you guys are seeing the difference. Who was the last person? Was there someone else who wanted to say, to add? Okay, okay, excellent. Okay, so hopefully now, right, at the end of this uh, hour and a half, right, of, of, of discussing Kant, you, the goal, right, the whole goal of Kant was really to help us become more attuned to that other voice, which remember at the beginning of class, none of us had it. We were thinking strictly along the lines of instinct. And now hopefully you are able to take a step back and hear more distinctly what reason is saying anytime you're about to use someone, right? Or discard someone that you will sense that's a very small discomfort, which the more you pay attention to it, the more it will grow and the more the voice of reason will become powerful in our lives, right? And again, for Kant, this ability to curb ourselves in the face of a, a human being is what really sets us free, right? This is what's interesting about Kant, right? It, it, uh, the moment that you can master yourself and not use someone and not discard them at will is the moment where you are supremely free because you are in full control of yourself, right? So that's where morality really shines in, in Kant's philosophy. This is really, it feels, you know, tedious oh i gotta like you know control my urges to use this person right now and and to just consume them and to just and then to throw them away <laughs> you know this is the urge very strong urge but the ability to master that for the sake of the dignity of the other human being is what will tell you how autonomous you are how free you truly are right uh josh is that is that a question or is that an old hand that was still up old hand Okay, good. All right. This is all for us today for Kant. Let's uh, just go over the homework or whatever is coming up. So uh, this weekend you have the test. You have test on Plato and the Song of Songs, which you should, probably should have already started. <laughs> uh, remember, it's two pages total, single spaced. You do one whole page per question, single spaced. You have two questions. And you remember, 
the more of the notes you put into your answer, the higher your grade. My goal, don't try to be smart. Don't try to bring in anything outside of what we did in class, right? That will not look good. <laughs> the goal of the test is simply for me to see that you're assimilating the material of the lecture, that you're um, absorbing what we're doing. So don't go, don't say anything else, <laughs> right? You want to really... Uh, stick to what we do in the lecture. And the more of the lecture you bring in, the higher your grades. So try to really, uh, that's why I, I, I really encourage you to take very detailed notes. Also, your answers need to have supportive quotes. So whatever you say about Kant, I'm sorry, whatever you say about Plato or the Song of Songs, you need to have quotes from the text. And usually you don't have to go beyond any of the quotes that we did in class together. You can just use those. So also this weekend is do your personal essay. Remember, you take a relationship crisis in your life, hopefully, preferably, or in someone else's life around you. And then you take either Plato or, or uh, Solomon or both. And, and you kind of write about what would they say? How could, what, what, what would be some of the wisdom, some of the advice they would give that couple in the story? Remember, it's 50% the story, 50% the advice. Okay, try to balance it out a bit. Uh, and that's 1.5 pages, single space. And then, of course, next week we start Kierkegaard. So you want to listen to the recording, do the audio question, do the reading, do the um, reading assignment. Okay, Kogan, you have a question. Go ahead. I had a question on Rumi. Um, mm -hmm. On his definition of love. Is his definition of love the nothing but gladness and kindness? So he has several, right? Several definitions. Just give me a few. <laughs> okay. And yes, that's a very direct definition, right? He has that one direct definition there, which you can elaborate on, but he says a lot, right? So you can add a few other things too. It doesn't have to be the exact definition, right? Make okay. sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on what's coming up this weekend? Anything else? All right. Let me stop the recording. Um, everybody can go. And uh, ah, yes, uh, just a, a reminder, you submit the test in the drive without looking at anybody else. The consequences will be dire if you do. <laughs> uh, and then a PDF. And also, yes, please save the test in one file, right? Both questions are in one file. I don't wanna be hunting for your questions all over the place. Uh, and then a separate file, of course, for the essay. David, do you have a question? Yeah, so the due date for both the test and the essay is Saturday night or Sunday? Yeah, so I, you know, I get to it on Sunday, so whatever, you know, <laughs> and usually I get to it like Sunday afternoon, <laughs> so bring it to me before then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and All also right. the, the, the essay itself is one page or 1.5 pages, sorry? 1.5 pages, the essay, single space, yeah. 1.5 pages. All right. All right, let me stop the recording.